My greatest regret in life is that time has passed by. The wonderful leads of my childhood and my twenties has long gone. And uh, by chance, I happened to return to Leeds just before the primary school I'd gone to was to be demolished. And this is a poem about that visit called Memento Mori. What brought me to that place the day before the demolition crew? 300 miles from home, in Leeds, I went to view my old school. Long change into a store for worn-out desks, demijohns of ink, stacks of registers and rubbers, even the odd cane. From a distance I saw at once a change, slipping roof slates, reeling gates, broken glass on window sills, doors ajar, a grey wet teddy bear face down on the littered yard, a shifty eyed man carrying out bulging cardboard boxes. You're from the council, sir, I know. I meant no harm, just helping things along, some bits for me kids. I shook my head and smiled. I came here once long ago. What's going on? And he replied, it's coming down tomorrow. You'd best look sharp and go round while you can. And so I went inside. And he replied, go past the cloakrooms. And I went past child-sized sinks, smashed dripping taps and numbered racks of pegs in black and corridors where smells of creosote lingered here and white wall tiles here and there still stuck with sugar paper murals for the coronation of our queen with crowns of gold milk bottle tops and carriages like coal carts and gummed on grass gone sear for atmosphere all interspersed with shaky copper-plated plaques, the Mall and St James Palace. The hall seemed tiny now, that once had loomed so large, shrunk to toy size almost, the stage where a blackboard I leaned on, broken casters, hundreds of hymn books, worn and torn and splashed with ink, spilling over empty milk crates and a canvas screen with a tonic sulphur curling round the edges. The classroom doors, brass knobs, had verdigris, and the cupboard where I gave Jean Crowell her first kiss was missing. I wondered where they had gone, my friends of all those years ago. The day the king died, Smigger came round every class, grave-faced. Boys and girls, I have bad news. Our king has died. And every face was shocked. And Vernon Long, who usually only belched and said loudly in the hush, he would a good him, and no public utterance of grief has ever matched Vernon's, then or since. For simple spontaneity of truth, then or since, in the end, there was nothing I wanted as a memento. The pictures seal in my mind, like the air in Tutankhamun's tomb, when grave robbers rolled aside the phalanxes of guardian gods in stone, the round cupola of Elibilane school crashed down. This is another poem of place. Um, I don't know whether Hobsbawm's view of the place is false. It's true for me. I think more the other way around. It was always the, the place that was the wonderful thing. And Huddersfield, I'm very ambivalent about. It has some beautiful facets, but uh, teaching one of them, for me, was not a good idea. Huddersfield, the second poetry capital of England. 
It brings to mind Swift leaving a fortune to Dublin for the founding of a lunatic asylum. No place needs it more. The breathing beauty of the moors and cheap accommodation drew me, but the total barbarity of the town stopped me from writing a single line. From the hideous facade of its railway station, Betjeman must have been drunk or mad to praise it, to that lump of stone on Castle Hill, a savage spirit broods. I remember trying to teach there at Bradley, where the head was some kind of XPT teacher who thought poetry was something you did to children, and his workaholic jackass deputy, obsessed with practical science and lesson preparation and team teaching, and everything on, above and beneath the earth except the education of the poetic spirit. And without that, as an, and as an example of what Pound meant about how a country treats its poets is a measure of its civilization. I once had a holiday job in a mill and the night watchman's killer Alsatian had more civilization than Huddersfield's deputy director of education. For a while I was granted temporary asylum at Royds Hall. At least some of the staff there had socialism, if not art. But soon it was spoilt for everyone when Jenks came to head English, sweating for his OU degree and making us all suffer. The kids hating his sarcasm and the staff his vaulting ambition. And I was the only one not afraid of him. His Achilles heel was culture. He was a yob through and through. And the head said to me, I've had enough of him throwing his weight round. If it comes to a showdown, I'll back you against him any day. But he got the degree and the job and the dollars. My old TC took him, but that was typical. After Roy Rich went, came a fat appointee who had written nothing and knew nothing, but knew everyone on the appointing committee. Everything I was in, every day I was in Huddersfield, I thought I was in hell, and Sartre was right and so was Johnson. Hell's a grammar school to this. Peter Porter, I salute you. And always I dreamed of Leeds, and my beautiful ten-year-old gifted sorry, and my beautiful gifted ten-year-olds, and Sheila, my genius child poet, and a head who left me alone to teach poetry and painting day in, day out, and Dave Clark and Diane and I in the staff room discussing phenomenology and Dasein analysis applied to Dewey's theory of education and the essence of forms in Plato and Plotinus, and John's a civilised HMI asking for a copy of my poems and Horowitz putting me in Children of Albion, and the Statesman giving me good reviews. Decades later in Byram Arcade, I'm staring at the facade of the poetry business, and its proprietors sitting on the steps outside, trying to look civilised, and their letter, Your poetry is good, but it's not our kind. And I wondered what their kind was. And besides, they're not my kind of editor, and I'm back in Leeds, with a letter from Seamus Heaney. Thank you, noble laureate, for liking my perfect rose. And yes, you're right about my wanting to get those new-gen poets into my classroom at Wither Park and show them a thing or two, and a phone call from Horowitz, who is my kind of editor still after 30 years. His mellifluous voice, with its blend of an Oxford accent and American high camp, so warm and full of knowledge, and above all, passionate about poetry, and I remember someone saying, if Oxford is a soul of England, Huddersfield is its arsehole. And um, finally, a poem about my childhood again, called Children's Games. Come Whitsuntide, the tally men grew fat. The poorest kids turned out in new blue worsted suits and matching caps. Socks in scarlet plaid and mirror shiny shoes. So when that special Sunday came, they never missed a door to knock and say, Something for me witsies, mister please. Mostly people gave a tanner or a threatening bit, and felt all good inside. The Fowlers had six boys, and Jim was once my mate, but I didn't like his manners much. He'd gozzle on the wall and wee behind wagons. When Julie saw his cock, he laughed and winked. So what, he said, age ten, and hefted it. Where's yours? His father liked to drink, and every night his mam 
and him went off down Hunslet Road and left their six-year-old the key and came back sing singing late. Their dad once went off on his own but never came back. His hidden ulcer hemorrhaged and he spewed back seven pints of Tetley's best. Some blood and enough guts to leave him dead. When Margaret Gardner came, I left Jim, and he went with the older lads, while I sat on Margaret Mam's wall and made up stories. Marlene joined up when we played doctors and nurses, and I was the doctor and Margaret the nurse and Marlene the patient. But Margaret would never change with Marlene, who egged us on. But I hung back when Marlene went off with the older lads, and Margaret for witches wore her new mauve blazer, and I loved her deep violet eyes, and her mam had such a knowing look all summer long.